Hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. Um, so, David, I mean, we've talked many, many times over the years, and I was looking back over some yeah, of when, these. When, when did we meet the first time? I don't even remember. I think probably 2010, okay. perhaps at a Unity party, so uh, <laughs> maybe that's why we can't quite sure. put it together. But I was looking back over my previous interviews with you, and there's one from 2011 where you said something which kind of set it up perfectly as like an opening question. So at that point in time, Unity was in the midst of rapid growth, and it's been growing pretty rapidly ever since then. But there was so much going on at that time, there was so much promise and potential, that I asked you where you thought you would actually be in five years' time, given how quickly things were changing. Um, what did the quote, say? What you said <laughs> was, we let the future happen and then follow it. We're a player in the ecosystem and not the creator of the ecosystem. The only way to know what we'll be doing in five years is to know, is to know the situation four years from now, which is what brings us to here. Sure. Um, and then at that point, you would ask, what would make our developers happy, productive, and successful in the near future? So the subject we're dealing with now is connecting your games to an audience, to a micro audience. We can define that term a little bit more later on. Um, is that the biggest issue facing Unity's users? And given the size of your, pop, your community now, I mean, developers in general. Yeah. Um, how to say? I mean, like, we started, the, you know, making software for developers. Actually, we first made it for ourselves, and then we realized that, you know, we, we might take the software that we had written for ourselves and bring it to the world, and maybe that would have an impact on the industry. We were, you know, <laughs> ambitious enough from the early days to think that we could do that. Um, and, and, and then we learned to make Unity fantastic, and it's, it's far from perfect, but it's really good, and it's getting better all the time. And then um, we managed to also bring the pricing down for the whole industry, so you know, we managed to bring out a free version, and we make the free version better, and yada, yada. Um, and then at some point, we realized that you know, once you have good software, you still have all these challenges left. Uh, some of them are, you know, content problems, like, uh, you know, you've got to fill your world with stuff, so that's why we created the Asset Store, which is old news, but still amazing. Um, and then we sort of kept tracking, like, you know, what's the biggest problem after that? Um, and, and, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the biggest problems now, and, you know, maybe they were always quite big, but, you know, we, we didn't maybe feel we had a way to address them until recently, is how to connect your game to an audience. How do you find an audience, and how do you sort of re relate work with the audience, and, and, and have hopefully have a long and prosperous relationship with, with whatever, whatever audience you have. Mm. I mean, so how much of that comes from a sense of duty, I wonder? Because obviously, to some degree, the problems like finding an audience for your product is a symptom of there being so many products out there, of the audience becoming so large. I mean, Unity has had, it, had its role to play in facilitating that growth. And it's been a good thing in many ways, but it does create, I guess, what are newer problems, I suppose. I mean, so is that something that Unity has felt the need to address? Like, that this, these, this is your community, so you need to be there to, to resolve these issues for them? Yeah, I mean, you know, Unity is sort of our love letter to the game developers, I think I could say. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, we, yeah, we just, feel their pain intensely and, and we see all these great games that come out and you know if you're not in the top whatever ranking if you don't get this feature you know a lot of these great great games just kind of drop to the ground and never go anywhere and it's super painful to watch um, and you know we, we sort of you're, we're pretty uh, crazy about t trying out different Unity games so like we, we play a lot of games that are completely unsuccessful and, and you know end up bankrupting their companies or you know impoverishing their, <laughs> their creators almost um, or forcing them to go back to you know normal paid jobs and so on uh, that really deserve better um, and uh, yeah so so you know we, we started looking out for ways of doing that and 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 we realized there were sort of different a few different tracks um, that could be addressed um, frankly for a while we thought this would be solved by the sort of plethora of companies out there uh, especially in the sort of 2010 11 time frame there was this massive investment you know like two three hundred companies got funding to build all kinds of services for game developers, and it turned into kind of a bloody mess. You know, we felt a lot of these companies weren't really good. You know, they were certainly not very stable. I mean, uh, what, what, what were the key problems? What were the key failings in what they were trying to provide, but they didn't end up being able to? I, I mean, um, how to say? I mean, you, you know, uh, building services is, is hard, and, and you know, making, making sort of stable businesses of providing services is hard, um, and there was too many people doing too many things. 
uh, which created you know this kind of alphabet soup of SDKs, and it's all kind of unstable. And a lot of these companies were created by good people, clever people. But you know, at some point, if you've got like ten competitors for the same kind of type of service, you know, it's 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 sort of an obvious thing that you know a year, two years later, like eight of them are going to be gone. Mm. And uh, and 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 we sort of felt that pain. And and you know, for a long time, we just sort of hoped the 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 sort of community of these companies would solve these problems. At some point, we started asking developers what they actually felt, and, and, and we were told very clearly that you know, they would prefer if, if we provided some of these services. Yeah. That's and kind of what, what led us to this you know, uh, new, new approach or like additional you know, uh, ambition for the company, like let's also try to help with this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna continually quote your old interviews to you throughout this. <laughs> <clears throat> but another thing you once said to me was that you see acquisitions as like time travel. It's like the ability to travel forward in time to a period where Unity has managed to organically acquire the skills it needs. And obviously acquisitions have been a big part of how you've dealt with these, with these problems and then the solutions you found for them. So, so it took us many years to get good at making a game engine. I mean, that took, you know, a decade arguably. Um, and, and, you know, I only feel we got pretty good at it in the last two, three years. Um, honestly, um, uh, and we're still learning. But but yeah, like there's these other, you know, there's a series of services that developers really need. You know, they 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 would, they're insane if they don't use analytics. They are insane if they don't consider ads in some way or form, either you know buying traffic or selling some of their traffic off. Um, and uh, and and they're crazy if they don't consider ways of 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 of, of helping their developers communicate. Uh, help, oh, sorry, helping their Gamers communicate with other gamers, sharing some of their experiences. If, if you're not at least considering things, these things, you're crazy. Um, and, and, and we looked at these problems, and they were, they're beefy, complex problems. And pressing problems as well, ones that needed to be dealt with in the shorter highly, term, not the, the longer term. And highly pressing. So we were like, okay, we could go out on this kind of tr trip, and you know, in three, four years, we might get there, and who knows. Um, and, uh, and instead, we looked at, at the market, and we found that there were some really, really good service companies that had been built um, that didn't quite have the success we felt they should have. Um, you know, we, 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 we had the luxury of kind of looking at everything, um, and we found a handful of little companies, or even not that little, um, that we thought were solving these problems in fantastic ways. Um, of course, one was uh, Amplifier with, uh, you know, what is now Unity Ads, which is making money, uh, making tons of money for, for developers. Um, there's every play which helps you know gamers connect with other gamers and show off what they're experiencing and, and that's fantastic and it's generating you know millions and millions of videos that are being shared everywhere and, and driving traffic and then there was a um, another a little company called the Playnomics that had a fantastic sort of analytics stack but also with tools to actually ma manage your users um, so we did these acquisitions and you're exactly right you know it's instead of going on this trip of going forward like three four years figuring this stuff out we could go sort of back in time to when these companies were created, and you know, in the moment you acquire these the, these companies, you sort of it's all part of you now, and you've you've taken that trip and you've built that software, and now we could take it and, and bring it to a much larger audience, which is which is fantastic. Well, I mean, this because an important part of this is that it's it's sort of it, it, it it blurs the line between development issues and marketing issues and outreach issues, and and it's all sort of coming together. I mean the. The term micro audience is used in the title of this yeah. this panel. When we talk about micro audience, we're not talking about a small audience. We're talking about a small slice of an extremely so, 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 large. So, so we're now living in this outrageously f liquid world, right? Where you know something in the order of two billion people have access to you know smartphones, app stores, um, and and it's growing still, and it'll grow to four or five billion people. It'll slow by slow by then, um, and a lot of these people are very happy to play games, and they have all kinds of different tastes, and if you're only reliant on being in the top of the rankings, only pretty, they're not all bland, but games that have very, very broad audiences can succeed in that environment. Whereas we know that, you know, inside two billion people, three billion people, there can easily be one, two, three million people that have a particular taste, a particular passion, and can you find these audiences, these kind of micro audiences? And that's, that's something we're very passionate about helping with. Yeah, I mean, and so for, for people making games, listening to this, I mean, how, how early in that process of creation, because that's what it all comes down to at the end of the day, is, is, the, is, the, is the desire to create games. I mean, that's where everybody starts from on a fundamental level. So how early in that process should people start thinking about who their audience is? I mean, is that what the key is to identifying your micro audience, your slice of that, of that pie? 
you know, I think, I think there's different answers. I mean, when you're building a product, um, you know, you can go at it very analytically and think about these things up front, or you build it for yourself and hope that there's enough people with the same taste. I think both are completely kind of, you know, practical approaches, and we've seen both succeed. I think sometimes just people building something for themselves actually ends up being better because it's just driven by more passion and more sort of intuitive insight. Um, regardless, you know, yeah, you should really make, I mean, what really works or how builds these audiences is, are things that are different, offbeat, strange, you know, um, fulfill a particular taste like really, really well, um, rather than something that sort of tries to be a few different things. And, and we see that, you know, even with very successful games like, uh, like Crossy Road, um, which, you know, is sort of a favorite example because we were allowed to tell the world how much money they made, whereas a lot of the times it's all very secret. Uh, you know, they made more than a million dollars on, on, on ads uh, using our system, and, you know, we're very excited to be able to sort of fund their further development of whatever they build. You know, it's such a, you know, it's an old genre, it's Frogger-ish, um, with, with such beautiful kind of style, and it's just really fluidly built, and it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful kind of cultural product. Um, so in, in, in that case, although it's a fairly classic game and obviously it makes a lot of money, I mean, that, that, there's a lot of detail in that design. There's, there's a lot of I mean, it's consideration built with some vision. in how in every individual part looks, how it works, the sound effects. Yeah. I mean, pretty much every part of it sort of sings of, a, of a attention to detail. And, and I, I haven't actually talked to these guys. They may be here. I think they're at the conference. Um, but, you know, did they think about the audience very much or did they just think about building a beautiful product? Uh, they probably did both, frankly. But I, I don't know. Uh, but the result is beautiful, and you know, last, uh, last I knew there were 7 million downloads or whatever. I think that it must be more now. Okay. Well, so we'll return to Crossy Road in just a moment. What, what I would like to, to press Which, you on... By the way, it's a small audience. <laughs> That's well, like yeah, nothing. I mean, basically. But like, what I would like to press you on some way is... I mean, Crossy Road, you know, you could maybe see it as lightning in a bottle. There's obviously a lot of craft that goes into it, but there, there's a certain aspect of <clears throat> what can feel a little bit like luck, like good fortune, like the wind's blowing in the right direction when you, when you do gain that sort of traction. I mean, for, for everybody else who feels they have something that's as well made as Crossy Road, but perhaps isn't getting that audience, I mean, what sort of solace can they take from things like analytics and ads? Like, how much, how much does that help them find, their, like, find the, the success and the, the, the security that they might otherwise lack? Honestly, I don't think... Well, it, it, okay, it really depends on, on the types of games. But, I mean, if, if the game isn't beautiful or enjoyable and doesn't have any spark, it, it sort of won't go anywhere regardless. And we, I see a lot of games that are sort of correctly put together and you see they've got all the elements, but it's not, you know, it's not a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, they, they don't go very far. Um, whereas, you know, if you build something that's great, um, the difference between then analyzing what's the actual, you know, player behavior or not can still be a very big delta. Um, and, and, you know, actually like seeing where you made little mistakes in the design, you know, where do people drop off? You know, there's still these mistakes that, that you can correct by using analytics. And, and once you have an audience that actually is playing your game, if you then offer to show some of them ads, um, the, you know, that, that can be the difference between something that makes very little money and something that makes a ton of money. Yeah. I mean, on, on analytics, I mean, that, that touches on sort of data driving design, which has been a, a bit of a sore point, a little bit divisive historically. I mean, do you, do you detect that anymore? I mean, just looking at the, the lineup here at Casual Connect, th there's an awful lot of discussion about that. It's almost taken for granted that that is how you need to approach things now. I don't know. I mean, like, of course, you know, at Unity, we sort of have a particular view on the world, which is that we see sort of not everything, but we see a very, very broad spectrum of things. Um, you know, we, we, we have customers that are very methodical and very kind of scientific in how they build games. And then we have people that built, you know, just like little art products. And, and as far as I can see, both can work. Uh, so I, I don't think it's an either or, you know, I, I, I think it's, yeah, I mean, this kind of schism and like, you know, fear that you have, to, like that, you know, the only future is one where you built uh, with data and sort of design everything through some sort of iterative AP process. A/B testing process. I, th I think it's. I think it's not realistic. Like every, e like all the good products have some spark, some creativity. Then that you know gets combined with, you know, let's weed out what doesn't work. Let's get rid rid of the, some of the stupid, clever ideas we had. Yeah, I mean, so uh, to me, every play seems like a possible addition to that process because. It allows a sort of a more organic growth, more organic spread of your game. I mean, would you would you agree with that? So, with or without the need to A/B test or whatever, I mean, if you can 
I think Crossy Road's a great example of this. You know, death animations and the little squawking noise the chicken makes. I mean, uh, for me, that just sort of lends, its, lends itself to v virality, like from user to user to user. I mean, is that, is that something you think it's, people it's, should be considering when they... I mean, it's, a, a, it's working. I mean, like, you know, um, you know, some of these videos get really far and, and, and drive real traffic. I mean, most videos are pretty boring, but some of them are just wonderful. And, and you know, especially, especially games that sort of considered early on, there is, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, ah, it's one of my favorite little stupid, stupid games. Um, um, stair Dismount. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, uh, not originally built with, I mean, EveryPlay didn't exist back then, but, but later, like a later version had EveryPlay. And, and what's fantastic is, you know, it's about this guy who falls down stairs. And you can put your enemies photo on his face. <laughs> it's freaking awesome. <laughs> you know, I have an enemy. I won't say who it is. Um, it's not an industry person. It's like yeah, a childhood you, enemy. Sure. It's like a childhood yeah. enemy. Anyway, I, I you know, found his photo online. I put it on this, on, on, on this guy and I, you know, I can always trip him downstairs and he breaks everything and it's wonderful. And, and, and the, developer that, uh, the developer of that game, being inspired by every play, he sort of the second version where he added every play, he made it you know, even more cinematic, even more dramatic, which I think is, makes for a better product in general, but also makes for these amazing videos of people getting hurt. But so and that drives traffic and, and you know, just adds value. And besides, you know, actually, you know, even, even before the traffic, even before the viral growth of games, you know, just being able to see like hundreds or thousands or even like millions <laughs> of, of people playing your game and seeing how they play, play your game, it's just a, you know, so inspiring and, and you know, such a strong kind of learning experience, whether for a second iteration of the game or a new game. I mean, so you think that, that all of these new tools and ways of spreading your game, they, they do ultimately lead back to a better product for everybody? I mean, because there will still be people out there that, who would just prefer just to create the exact game they want to make and then unleash it on the world and hope for the best. I mean, without, without necessarily anything else interfering with that. Uh, absolutely, and, and they do. And, you know, some of them are actually successful and some are not. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, think, I think, well, in the industry, as wonderful it is, as it is, you know, it's also very competitive. And... You know, being a, ha having enough income to build a second game or build a you know livelihood or whatever, you know, it's sort of the difference between you know making one game or making many, and 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 uh, and you you know you want to stack your deck with with odds because if you if you just rely on luck, um, I mean your odds are lower and you know maybe you'll have a different job next time, which is sort of sad for the industry. And so, does this all ultimately feed into ads, like so analytics to, to optimize your audience, to optimize your game, to, to, to give them the most pleasure, every play to help spread it? But ultimately, that just that will serve an ad network, which will feed back in. And as you said before, Crossy Road is the the ten pole example of how that can work for a developer. So, I mean, like uh, you know, uh, premium downloads, you know, games that cost money. Uh, you know, we've, we've thought and feared they would go away, and they haven't. They're games that actually make very good money like that. Um, so for them, ads are much less relevant. Uh, you know, they have much smaller audiences that have all paid, you know, that, that's a different, different thing. However, like free games get vastly bigger distributions, and games like Crossy Road get, you know, yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they're past the 10, 10 million downloads now. Um, you know, you can't, I mean, it's, it's unlikely you could sell a $5 game like that, or you, nobody has done it, as far as I can tell, um, on mobile. But, um, but, but, but for games like that, you know, the, the stats show that even games that sort of monetize well, you know, end up having very few percent of the people actually spending money. And if you can then analyze and try to figure out who's not spending money, show them a little bit of ads, and Crossy Roads does it very well. Tap Titans is another favorite. Super addictive game. You're never forced to watch ads, but once in a while you get an offer, to do it, and if you do, you know, you get you progress a bit further. I watched probably 10 minutes of ads in that game across, you know, 20 hours of gameplay. So, in terms of in terms of ads, can you give a little bit like more specific detail on what you see as the best way to, to serve ads? Because I think again, it, it's this fear of being intrusive, of allowing yeah, yeah. of allowing these factors to impinge on enjoyment of the game, I, I on, the, there, on the there's, creativity. There's, there's different approaches to it. What I mean, the games that where I happily watch ads and I feel no frustration, no annoyance, and I'm kind of curious about what I'm seeing in the ads. Uh, because it's mostly game ads, and you know, I'm sort of interested in that, um, are, are games that sort of let you optionally watch ads from time to time. Um, I think there is some cleverness in like not offering it all the time, but sort of making it as a special offer. It seems to work better, at least for me as a, as a gamer. I, you know, I tend to tap, tap that button more if it's not like something I can always do. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, you know, these games are making tons of money. Um, 
while never hassling you with, with ads. And actually, like, the gameplay is very fluid. You just keep playing, and it's enjoyable kind of the whole time. Um, I mean, there are other sort of pre-roll ads and sort of more aggressive stuff where you have to watch an ad after you die and all that stuff. I'm sure it's worked for somebody, but I mean, as a gamer, that's sort of where I get frustrated. Unfortunately, it's not necessary. But again, we're coming back to that place of how much do you allow that inform the way you build your game and how much don't you? Because as you say, that there are certain kinds of games where the ads will slip in quite, quite naturally, quite organically. Other kinds of games, perhaps not. So, I mean, is there a more serious question people need to ask themselves about the way they go about creativity in this, in this world of free, in this world of abundant product? So I must admit, I'm not a game designer, right? So, so, so I, I have a passion for game design. I play a lot of games. But you know, when it comes down to these things, there are sessions, I think, here that talk about that. There's a Unity Ads session on Friday, uh, where I think we'll go into some of these things and also to go into every play. Um, um, so, so I'm not the sort of authority on that. But I just see that you, know, you have to sort of, there's a long thought process that people have to go through deciding you know, what, yeah, how to monetize. You know, and and these, there, I, I buy a lot of premium downloads. I, you know, I'm very happy with that as well. Well, I mean, we've got plenty of time left for questions, if anybody has any. Could you raise your hand? Well, maybe I'll start with the first question. And somebody has to ask it. I'm sorry, it's a, a difficult <laughs> question. But uh, Chrome support and the, the deprecation of that, what's the status? And what are you doing to try and sort of keep the customers going? You, you mean the, the, the browser plugin? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't talk about, so Unity is a much more complicated business. I could talk on for hours about how we do consoles and PC. And you know, it just happens that we, you, know, you often slip into mobile because it's sort of you know, something a lot of us are passionate about. Um, so you know, from the very early days of Unity, we had a browser plugin that you can install. And I think last count is like, it's probably approaching half a billion installs. Um, and it just so happens that some browsers are now deciding that they want to sunset the concept of plugins. And uh, I completely understand the logic. You know, it's, these APIs have been abused many times. We've not abused them, and our customers have not abused them. But there have been plugins that are completely abusive and take over your computer and do all kinds of crazy shit. And, uh, and, uh, and these are the same APIs that we use for like, you know, enabling cool games. Uh, so I understand this is happening. Um, it's, 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 um, Fortunately, also happening at a time when WebGL is really coming to prime time. And we started working on, on WebGL support uh, actually years ago and, uh, and now have you know, a beta product on the market that people are use, using. Um, nothing is perfect in the browser world because you know, the plugins could never work quite everywhere. Um, and WebGL doesn't work everywhere. <laughs> Combining these things actually works pretty well. I mean, like, you know, if you add together the browsers where there is a plugin installed or we, where you can install a plugin, plus the browsers where WebGL works, that gets close to 100%. Um, and uh, so we support both. And, 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 but of, obviously, like, we expect more and more things to transition to WebGL where we have a fantastic product that works shockingly well. Um, and what's cool is that we see games that are coming from mobile being put uh, up uh, on, on the web, either for sort of testing out or for, uh, or for full gameplay experiences. And uh, the sort of part of this dramatically cross-platform world that we're seeing, where you know we see games, great games that don't address like one or two platforms, but address like eight platforms, including WebGL, including several consoles, and these are like two, three-person teams. You go back in this industry six years or seven years, like even a thirty-person team wouldn't even attempt that. So, so there's many cool things that are happening, and some of them are frustrating too. But you know we have the sort of uh, Unity is very flexible, and we have a fantastic technical organization that sort of, you know, uh, is trying to stay ahead of this curve, and we are mostly, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's exciting times. Technology is never stagnant. So do, do you see the momentum returning to WebGL and, and, and the plugin? Because obviously it offers a great deal of accessibility, like no, no barrier whatsoever, not even so much as clicking a button and waiting for a download, really. You know, we see things happening there. I haven't seen sort of a runaway success recently. Um, we used to have some very successful, um, both in Europe and actually in Asia, uh, sort of browser MMOs that were built with Unity that were driving, as far as we could tell, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. Uh, games we've never heard of here. <laughs> uh, we just saw some website, you know, with some strange name downloading a lot of the plugin, and you know, eventually we met some of these people in China and, 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 and Korea, um, which is very cool. But, um, but uh, we haven't seen sort of recently that. What we do see is a resurgence of PC gaming, where a lot of people are bringing Unity games to PC and Mac, um, uh, you know, experimenting with Oculus. There's so much, so, much, so much sort of energy in that space right now that uh, 
you know, we're really looking forward to seeing sort of the next two years of that. I mean, how, how, much, how much more important is, uh, is Oculus to you now? I mean, I, I was at the Unite conference last year. There was, a, there was a massive uptick in the amount of people talking about it, the amount of sessions about it. I know that there's a stat relating to how many games are being developed for Oculus with Unity as well. Yeah, apparently almost everything that is built for, for Oculus is built with Unity. Uh, at one point we heard 91%. I don't know what the exact number is. Um, I don't know. I mean, Oculus doesn't exist. I mean, it's like a, it's like a developer kit. I mean, that's sold probably 100,000, so it's, it's, it's a fairly popular development kit, but it's not a commercial product um, yet. But, uh, you know, ever since I tried it the first time, uh, Brendan brought kind of a very wonky, wobbly, kind of gaffer taped together piece of, you know, develop kit um, to our office in Copenhagen just before the, um, just before the, um, the Kickstarter. So it's like three years? Uh, it's been a while anyway. And, and, and the moment I tried it on, I just knew I wanted to stay in that world. It was just fantastic. So, so I, I believe in that. Uh, you know, whether it's Oculus, there's Morpheus now from Sony, there's a number of other people coming in. Um, I think it's kind of beneficial for everyone that, will, that, that there be more than one type of hardware. Um, how big it will, will it be? I, I don't know. I mean, even, you know, even Brendan and Zuckerberg and these guys, they don't know. Yeah. But in, in this landscape, though, I think it... All developers should at least think about trying to capitalize on a market that's still yet to even emerge in any form whatsoever because there, there was always a t there was a time before iOS, there was a time before this, there was a time before everything. And if you were there at the right place at the right time with the right product, then you, you could be one of the people to actually facilitate that and, and to grow that market to make sure that it exists at all. You know, absolutely. And, and, and you know, what's, what's sort of a great fortune about uh, VR is that so many people believe in it or have this intuitive kind of knowledge or like faith that it will be big so there's a lot of energy a lot of creativity going into it and i've seen just in the last few months i've seen amazing things being built for it um really making me believe in the format um not as something where you port games but really where you build sort of vr first experiences uh, again is that does that mean that there will be like you know 30 million kits and it's sort of a hardcore thing or will it be like you know a billion um I don't know. Obviously, it won't be a billion any, any time sort of yeah. soon. Well, Mark Zuckerberg is hoping for the latter, I think. Obviously. If uh, anyone out there has a question. Well, maybe I'll ask another question as well. Um, crystal ball, uh, form factors. We've now got watches. Phones are getting bigger and smaller. Tablets are getting bigger and smaller. Then there's the big screen TV in the house. In two years' time, are we going to nuclear it around at one of two or three sizes? Where, where, where's your prediction where things are going to go? You know, I, I never... I never think like that, um, and that sort of goes back to what I had apparently said five years ago, which is, you know, as, 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 a, as a middleware company, our job is sometimes to get a little bit ahead, but a lot of the time it's just kind of enabling, making sure that all these form factors work, and then we let the sort of industry knock itself out, you know, between the developers and the ecosystem guys and the consumers. They, they, they'll hash it out, they'll figure out what they want. As long as Unity is enabling it, and we're partners with Oculus, we're partners with Sony, so we make sure that you know, Unity needs to work really well on all these new platforms, smart TVs we've done a fair amount of work on, and so on. And, and, then, and then beyond that, we, we don't have to figure it out. I, personally, I don't know. Like, you know I'm, I'm extremely like, bearish on TV. Maybe that's just because I never actually owned a TV. Uh, I'm very bullish on, on VR. I don't really know why. I just, you know, it's, it's so visceral to me. Watches don't speak to me. I haven't worn a watch you know, since I was like a kid. A really small kid. Um, so I, I don't know if that's going to work. My wife is really excited about watches. You know, she, she's, she's working with uh, art and clay and stuff and has you know, dirty fingers. And having something on her hand that sort of you know, stays out of the fray seems like a clever idea. I have no idea. You know, really no idea. Well, I mean, I, I think that for the majority of people, particularly at a place like Casual Connect, there's many pro platforms you can go to, but you're really talking about mobile, you're really talking about tablet. That's a huge, huge amount of it. Um, it's something I do every week for the website I work for. I, 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 I update the charts for mobile. Now, I mean, it, it can be pretty sobering reading, at least on the top grossing side of things, that the top 10 rarely changes, the top five never, ever changes. Um, obviously, you, you have some insight into, into running a business, into, into starting up a business. I mean, how should developers even think about success now as it, as it applies to those platforms? Because it, it, it seems that it, it can be hard to look at that situation and think I can organically grow from nothing sure. a hit of that size now that these guys are up there and they're, and, and they're, and they're holding court. 
yet people do it all the time. Not not get it to, to not not getting to top five grossing. Um, you know, which seems I don't know if it's unfair, but it's definitely frustrating for the whole industry to see that how stuck that is. Um, beyond that, there's just a lot of money being made, being made uh, by you know by these micro audiences. You know, if you actually look at like different uh, different markets, like local markets, uh, will have hits that actually make very significant amounts of money. So, so when we look at the top rankings, we're looking at the U.S. often, right? And there's many other markets that are very significant. You know, you look at the, you look at the Japanese uh, app market. Um, you know, that's much much more varied. Uh, you know, like 70% of these games are Unity there, and 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 many of them are made by much smaller studios. Um, and then besides that, you have things like like Tap Titans, Cross Your Road, etc., that are making a lot of money, but they never show up in 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 the uh, in the uh, in the grossing chart because most of their money is coming from elsewhere. This is this is a good idea for people to do at the moment to look on a more global scale to, to see which which markets are coming up and, and new places they can send their product to. Yeah, that, that's one. And then, like like I said, like you know, th think about not. Well, if if you, okay, if you want to shoot for that top these top positions, you better go and you know build an insanely good team. You have to have all the skills. Like for 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 being up there, it's not enough to. You know, just be a creative designer. Unfortunately, I wish it were, but you know, it's not enough. You need to really think through sort of every step of monetization, and then you probably need a lot of capital. Uh, you know, seriously, in Finland, uh, with their best fiend, um, which is a fantastic game, by the way, I played it a lot. It's Unity, which makes me happy. Um, you know, to to get into, I mean, they're doing really well. Uh, apparently, their their daily active are pretty insane, uh, and um, but they raised a lot of money. I mean, but they could because they they they, they showed. You know this, the early work to uh, to investors, and you know it's totally believable that they could be up there. They needed millions of dollars to do it, and, and they did. Uh, it's a small team. I mean, you know, it's an indie team, maybe not, but I mean, these are you know. It's still only about a dozen of them or so, and I, I in fact talked to them the other day, and, and and what I was told was that it's sort of damaging to even look at that top five necessarily because it's sort of it's just a completely different landscape now. So it's it's a rarefied air those guys are breathing. They've got the marketing capital and so on, but you can still build a very big, very successful company outside of that top five, no problem at all. No, so it's if like you just focus on that top ten, you're not really getting the picture. It, it, it's maybe it's stupid to take metaphors from totally outside of our world, but you know I, I drink a lot of these kind of you know uh, you know uh, kind of uh, organic you know niche sodas. You know, with, with actual fruit taste and not so much sugar. And, you know, there's t total, a lot of companies that are really successful doing that. And obviously, like, you know, Coca-Cola sells, I think it's like a billion cans per day. And, you know, these guys are probably happy if they sell, like, you know, some tens of millions per year or whatever. But these are real businesses and they can be totally successful and, you know, pay the bills and, you know, provide for, for families and, and for growth and for experimentation. So, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, you know, you shouldn't, comp don't compare yourself to Coca-Cola. That's just insane. Still time for a, a question or two? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone over to you. Okay, you say you don't have a watch. You don't watch TV. Uh, so confession while you're on stage. What, tab what devices do you use? Do you have a tablet? What kind of tablet is it? Do you use a laptop? What kind of laptop do you use? What, what's your, your phone type? So I have a problem, which is I like small phones. <laughs> so so, so I'm now I'm on my third 5S because they break and shit. And... Uh, and you know, I really I can't even go to the larger sizes, um, which would make me like a terrible person to go and design games or something because you really have to think about these form factors. But that's not my job, right? My job is to think about sort of the software and the and the platform shifts and and, and provide tools for developers. So that's okay. I, I can do that with a sh small phone. Uh, I don't know. I, maybe I'm old-fashioned or or something. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I don't really necessarily get. Or I mean, I, I have these devices. I you know try them out. I love iPads, by the way, but minis like the small ones. I don't know. Um, there's, there's no clear answer, but um, I, I look at everything. But yeah, there are very, very few objects actually really fit in my life. You know, I have a s small laptop, small everything. Do you manage to find find time to play games that aren't made using Unity? Because um, yeah, there's yeah. an awful lot of those. Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I play a lot of Total War. <laughs> well, when everyone else is sleeping. We, we can't let these guys off stage until at least one person from the audience asks a question. <laughs> We've got them captive. Hey, who's, who's using uni Unity here, just out of, for the hell of it? Woo! <laughs> okay, so what's, what's the most annoying thing about Unity? Tell me. 
There's a hand in the back. Okay, here, here we go, here we go. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say that uh, I tried to make a game on the watch in Unity. Yeah. And the most annoying thing that I couldn't port the game onto the watch. I had to go through Android Studio to do that. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I understand that frustration, you know? Um, and and there, there, there's a sort of, um, you know, there, you might say there's a, there's a meta level to that answer or that comment. And that is simply that, you know, the price of supporting a very broad community and the price of trying to sort of think where things are going is sometimes that we have to sort of ignore things that feel kind of niche and early um, or at least not support them as well as we should. So that, that, that is, I, I totally understand that frustration. I'm also unhappy that we can't do all these things. Um, sometimes things like that work. Somebody has been creating like really amazing uh, Android uh, kind of home screens with Unity. Uh, that seems to actually work, uh, which is cool. Um, but no, there, there are always going to be sort of little holes in our lineup. Sorry about that. And one more question from the same era. Yeah. Uh, do you have any plans to replace MonoDevelop with something better, at least for Mac? <laughs> well, you can use other systems, but uh, well, yeah, no, it's, it's a complicated question. Um, we, we try to make uh, like Visual Studio work really well, but obviously that's PC. Um, I don't, what, 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 what would you prefer? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, these are great, great guys. It's always hard to lean on other commercial products as kind of core stuff. You know, if you have to buy Unity plus some other people's stuff, that, you know, gets kind of complicated from a business perspective. Uh, but no, I agree. I mean, uh, we have deep respect. We, we use a lot of their software. Anybody else annoyed with Unity at the moment? Or, or, if, or you can say something nice, too. It's OK. <laughs> yeah? Oh, sorry. There's a mic coming. Prefabs and prefabs. <laughs> um, OK, I've got to read an email to you. Um, it's uh, sent a couple of hours ago. Sorry, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, that reminds me, sent by a guy who shall remain nameless, but who is a core part of the team and a very smart developer. Time is up, Joachim. Joachim is our CTO. We made a bet after, after development of nested prefabs had been halted and postponed back in 2012. I was concerned it would result in it being delayed for several years, but you were confident that wouldn't be the case. Regrettably, it seems I've won. <laughs> It's, it's the same thing, you know, we, we're, we're ambitious people, we try to build so much stuff, we really want to make Unity good, and in many ways, I think, I hope you agree with me, it is very good in many ways, and, and we just make stupid, stupid, stupid decisions sometimes, you know, we ignore stuff that is important because it turns out it's actually a very complicated problem for us to do really well, you know, we would have to rewrite some significant systems, and, you know, things are layered, so, you know, that means other stuff needs to be touched, and, you know, there are priorities that are probably wrong or maybe wrong, but, you know, so software development at a large scale turns out to be a very complex problem and really smart people end up making really stupid decisions sometimes because of dot, dot, dot reasons, you know. Um, so sorry about that. Has it, has <laughs> it is, it, however, very much on the schedule right now. <laughs> has, it, has it become more difficult to think about your roadmap, about going forward the bigger you've become? Do those problems just become a little bit more difficult to, to conceptualize and to understand how it's all going to play out? It's kind of always been difficult. I think we've always made pretty good decisions and pretty bad decisions kind of at the same time. Um, it's, it's hard to say, you know. Um, okay, I mean, there's sort of two fundamental forces at play in software development, I think, at least when done sort of well. You know, one is that you follow your intuition and you let the developers who are actually creating the product do what they believe in because that way you get everything that gets done is done with kind of love and passion. Um, the flip side to that is that, you know, if you only do that, you also fail to listen to, you know, the market or what people are actually saying. Um, if you only listen to what people are saying, you get, you know, faster horses, I think they say. You know, you lose some of that creativity, you lose some of the vision and some of those sort of, you know, major leaps you can do technologically and conceptually if you only sort of do these incremental steps. Obviously, we have to do both, and obviously, we've never do, done you know, both, and we've been too good at doing the intuitive stuff and not quite as well as good as at, at, at following and, and listening. Um, I think uh, we've changed, I mean, it it's gets very technical. We're, we're changing some of our process, and, and we're you know, putting in sort of, how to say, sort of a little bit of safety in our, in our decision making now to avoid ignoring you know, obvious stuff. I should say, is that, is that okay? <laughs> Sorry, anyway. Okay, well, I think actually 
end, thank you for asking questions because we're an hour right out of time. Um, okay. So please join me in thanking the gentleman for speaking today. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew.